So I've heard this week, I want to jump straight into it. And I want to start off with a quote for this week's topic. And right. um, he here it comes. And it's from somebody called Pliny the Elder. Um, and it goes like this. Here, a wretched race is found, inhabiting either the more elevated spots of land or else eminences artificially constructed and of a height to which they know by experience that the highest heights will never reach. There they pitch their cabins. Uh, any idea what people group he's, uh, he's talking about? It's an old so, German dude. Actually, I talked about Pliny the Elder in my medieval mythology. He is one of the guys that wrote all sorts of stuff about parts of the world that were that no one had been to from Europe. Yeah. So yeah. a lot of the ideas are some of some of the ideas are good. Some of them are bogus. I think you know this probably. If I had to guess what he's talking about, I'd think he's probably talking about Scandinavia. But no. uh, no, just but kind of, close, uh, close, yeah. Now he's actually talking about the Frisians, and um, the Frisians are a a race or a people group in the Netherlands um, that are still around today, and uh, they're interesting for several reasons. Um, what language? And that's why I wanted. To... Well, they speak their own language called Frisian. And uh, this language is actually, if you look at Old Frisian, it's the language that's closest to Old English. Oh. And modern day Frisian is actually still the language that is closest to modern day English as well. Hmm. And, and uh, I want to talk to you a little bit more about their history, um, where they came from, uh, what religion they had, and some of their culture, and, um, and what happened to them. Um, so and, and it starts off with the I want to start off with the Romans when they arrived in what is now the Netherlands. Um, so they arrived, I think, around 15 BC, and they set up a military camp in what is nowadays the city of Nijmegen. Um, and there were two tribes, uh, the Batavians and the Frisians. And the Batavians were along the Rhine Delta, and up north from that was mostly just the Frisians. So those were the two Germanic tribes. Um, and uh, they, they were living there uh, basically until the, the Great Migration periods. And they used to think that these people were living there continuously. But okay, now it turns Great out... Migration, I believe yes. that's also when the, that's when the Lombards also started coming down. Yeah, exactly. So, and so most of the... Uh, inhabitants of the Netherlands uh, left um, for because of the great, great migration period, but also because the, the coastal region was changing. So if you look at the coast of the Netherlands, and I got to stay true to my notes somewhat, um, there is a map called uh, Lyria Mapping, and I'll in include it. Uh, but it, uh, it shows you how the, the, the coastal line, so the country is somewhere between England, France, and Germany and Scandinavia, right? It's right in the center. Um, but uh, the coastal line has changed significantly over the years because of climate changes. Um, so if you look at the, 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 the last ice age, um, but up to about 1500 BC, uh, the Netherlands was actually quite big. It was a lot of land, quite large, and... Um, you know, you, you'll recognize it, but it lo it looks actually bigger than or quite a bit different than today. Water level was lower, right? Back the water then. level was significantly lower. Yeah. 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 And I yeah, want to talk to you to you about uh, the years 300 AD to about 800 AD, so the the start of the Viking Age, and at that time it was a warm period. So the medieval times were actually quite warm, and because of that. Um, the uh, the water had come in from the sea, and a lot of the the, the country of what is now the Netherlands was actually flooded, um, and that's why when um, this uh, this old Roman dude, uh, what was his name? I just Pliny mentioned him. Yeah, Pliny the Elder. Uh, when he talks about these these more elevated spots of land, he was talking about terps, what we call terps. Um, so basically. 
um, during the Great Migration, the lands were mostly abandoned uh, and the Anglo and Saxons, the Anglos, the Saxons and the, the Utes from Denmark came in um, and basically some of them would go to England and others would stay. And that's how, um, that's how we, the, the, the language was closely related to English as well, because it's basically the same people. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but because uh, so much of the land was flooded is what they would do is they would build these hills called terps and uh, they would put their farms on there and then they would have their cows grazing in the area. And then whenever the sea would come in, like everything would be flooded except for their houses and the cattle would of course come back to the hill. And then over time, as the, the, the town started to grow, they started connecting each other's houses, their turps. That's how they created dikes. And then of course, after uh, hundreds of years, they started uh, building more and more dikes and fighting, starting that whole battle against the sea where they pumped out water using the water mills, etc., uh, to form what is uh, what currently looks like the Netherlands. Um, uh, but yeah, so these people, they were always thought that, you know, like, oh, well, these are Germanic people and they just lived there from the, from the beginning. But no, they were actually Anglo-Saxons and, and Jutes, so Danes that came here and they, they kind of resettled the land and they just took over the name of the Frisii and they called themselves Frisians. Um, but when it comes to religion, they were very much similar to their Scandinavian brethren. So the names were a little bit different for the gods. So instead of Odin, it was like Wodan. Um, and I think it was Donar for uh, Thor. And uh, so there was another third main god that I should have written down, <laughs> but I have not. Um, but re regardless, so the religion was, was quite similar. Um, and they also had um, similar ideas around sacrificing people uh, for example was something they did so especially dealing with the elements they believed all shapes had uh, souls in them um, especially like swords would have very specific strong soul in them strong power um, and they um, uh, where was I going with this they um their religion was uh, also included sacrifices and like one of the things that they did for example was they would draw their lot which is basically they would have lots um and then whoever pulled the shortest lot would be sacrificed and that would be through different means for example one way is like their heads would be bashed in or they would be decapitated uh, and sometimes they would tie people to uh, poles in uh, in shallows and wait for the sea the tide to come in and basically devour them uh you know hoping that that would somehow influence the the gods and please them and uh, give them a better crops or, or better uh, situation in the in the next year um so it was you know, very at least, at least mm -hmm. the aztecs would sacrifice other people groups and not their yeah. own citizens <laughs> Is yeah, it? and it was really up to to lots. Like in 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 Dutch, you say your lot is set. Like you know, like if you pulled it and you were like a, a child, you you would sacrifice your own child. And people actually love their children. It turns out, you know, like just as much as we do. They would always say, "Well, people had lots of children. They felt differently." Nowadays, we don't actually think that's the case, um, but they still went through with it anyway. So they, they took their religion pretty seriously. And that's one of the reasons I was interested in the Frisians is because um, they were, they took a very long time to Christianize. And there are, there are several reasons for that as well. But uh, let me go back to my, my notes actually. So I don't go completely off script. Um, so yeah, so from the year 300 to 700, they took over the whole coastal area um and uh, what is now the netherlands northern germany and parts of denmark and this also included the city of dorestad um and this was um and with this they they created this magna frisia um 
And Dorestad was the largest settlement in the northwest of Europe. And it was basically a, a trading hub between the, the River Rhine and the North Sea, uh, where they would trade with uh, England and the Scandinavian countries. And this made them extremely wealthy. Um, it was known, for example, for its Frisian uh, textiles, but also for its mint. So they really loved gold, uh, <laughs> which was found as, as far away as Russia. Yeah, it was Austin Powers reference there. Um, but yeah, but they would they would have very expensive jewelry, and I'll include some of it as well, uh, that even had pearls from India. So they were very well connected, and they actually had settlements all down the Rhine. And many cities today, like Mainz, uh, for example, in Germany, uh, and uh, I think C Cologne as well, they still have Frisian quarters or settlement um, city streets because um, uh, street names because that's they would have like settlements or or just parts of the city where Frisians would live hmm. um, and do their trades. So um, so yeah. So if you look at back at a map uh, nowadays, um, it, it looks completely different. Um, I talked about that a little bit um, already. But what was also interesting is that the western part of the, the country, that strip of land uh, where the people lived, um, was also kind of shielded from the rest of Europe because behind it laid um, basically bog, bog land. And that's not the case anymore now. Nowadays, they call it the green heart, and it's mostly just meadows with cows on it. Hmm. Uh, but at the time, it was completely mosquito-infested lands that were basically very hard or, you know, closely impossible for armies to penetrate. So the main threat was always from the sea. So basically, the Vikings and, and um, other threats like that. Um, and that's what I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about, because they have recently discovered that the Frisians actually shared a lot when it came to the Vikings as well, when it comes to culture um, and also when it comes to the kind of the kinds of jewelry they found. So they found similar jewelry all across the Magna Frisia that, you, that can be found in Scandinavia as well. Yeah, I'm looking um, at I'm looking at some of that stuff actually right now it also looks uh, similar to the early anglo-saxon style as well like kind of similar style of artwork and um patterns you know, yeah, and, and and they traded so they had a lot of trade going on with the uh with the scandinavian land um and at one point uh the frankish empire under charlemagne we, we've done a couple episodes about him already started to expand and expand and of course this was christian christian land and then england was christian as well and uh, the franks would actually uh, support the christian missionaries coming from england uh, that will come to this area and try to um, yeah do their mission so they would send soldiers to protect these missionaries and they, these missionaries would try to christianize the the region um, but they had a very hard time uh, at doing this because typically what would happen is that uh, the leader, the king, would be Christianized and then the, the noble nobility would follow. And then, you know, in the end, uh, the common peasant would, would also adopt the religion. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Frisian culture was very much egalitarian. So the, the common peasants... Uh, felt that he was or had as much as a, a right or yeah had as much of a stature as the the nobleman so to speak so there, there wasn't very much of, of a king or nobility you, you also not find if you go to Friesland today you won't find tons of castles um, or even the Netherlands at all you won't find a lot of castles you'll find some smaller fortresses but there, there never was this whole culture of, you know, bottom down, one king to rule them all. That just wasn't part of the culture. And you can still feel some of the remnants of that today in, in culture where typically people are very stubborn, uh, very egalitarian and not not willing to take any uh, shit really from, uh, from from the government and from leaders. 
And it might also be a reason why the Dutch Republic was uh, basically one of the first republics in, in the world in the 17th century or 16th century to get rid of, uh, of the monarchy at the time. Maybe they passed anyway. some of that attitude on to America too, like during yes. the colonial period. Because, you know, like traditional Americans have that similar kind of attitude. Like, I don't really care what uh, the government says or wants. Like, if it does, if you can't explain it to me, then uh, I'm not just going to follow you. Yeah, and the Dutch were the first to recognize the United States as a independent country so uh, for sure yeah um but i do want to talk a little bit about um this um and actually one of the viewers was asking about charles uh, of martel and mm -hmm. um, i do need to do a story about him at some point uh at, at this point he was actually fighting the duke of um it was basically a warlord um of the frisians and he was fighting with uh, with the, the Franks over this wealthy city called Dorestad, uh, of which, by the way, there's nothing left, pretty much. There's nothing left of uh, what was once one of the, the richest settlements in north northwestern Europe. Um, but Redbad, um, he was uh, their, their duke, and he once defeated Charles Martel in battle. So he was very able. Um, and he would he would basically go on raids into the Frankish territory as it expanded, and he would uh, try to take as much wealth and, and anything he could basically with him. Um, so in that in that sense, he truly was a Viking as well. Um, he also this this guy Rapid also has an interesting story. Um, he was about to be baptized because apparently his previous uh, his daughter had previously been baptized herself. Um, but so the legend goes that as he was about to step in the, the water uh, to be baptized, he changed his mind um, because apparently he asked, uh, well, this is the legend about his ancestors, if he would be if they were in heaven. Um, and he was told that he would not be able to find him in heaven. And then he said he preferred to spend eternity in hell with his pagan ancestors rather than be in heaven with a pack of beggars. <laughs> Which I thought was interesting. Uh, um, well, yeah, maybe it's he a changed legend. his mind it's, since then. Yeah, well, he, he didn't he did change his mind um, right right as he was about to be baptized. But it's probably also because he was very much connected to the Scandinavian world and adopting Christianity would put that relationship at risk. Um, and that's where a lot of the wealth came from. Um, so that, that could be one of the reasons. Um, so yeah, in the end, uh, Frisia was Christianized and it was fully taken in by the Frankish empire, uh, but it took uh, almost 170 years and they sent over many missionaries, including people like, uh, let me see, I wrote down his name, uh, Willy Board, Broad Bishop and Saint Boniface, Bonifacius, we say in, uh, in, in Latin. I don't know if that actually means Boniface, I've but that's how you say it in English. Boniface before. Yeah. So he was uh, he was massacred um, in what is nowadays Dockham, and there's actually um, a pilgrimage uh, area there where uh, still every year between twenty five and forty thousand pilgrims go, um, and I believe you can also find his bones. And it's interesting the town I live in. We also have a saint that was killed by the Vikings, and that we still have the remnants as well. And that um, the way that these um, English people mostly would try to spread religion was one thing is they would smash all the the holy places and then nothing <laughs> would happen. And then they would say, see, where's your God? And people were impressed by that. Um, of course, they also put an end to sacrificing people. And some people actually okay. enjoyed that. They didn't want to sacrifice impressed? their kids anymore. Well, uh Wait, yeah, they were impressed by somebody by the English smashing up their statues. Yeah, because nothing would happen that they had the balls, you know, it's kind of like uh, our God is greater kind of thing. Uh, uh, basically, uh, I don't know. 
<laughs> or it's like, but nobody tried to smash up their statues before then, and they didn't realize, like, uh... Yeah, yeah. I know, like, that. that's the way I, I read it, and I watched a documentary on it recently. I don't know if that's the case, like... That might work yeah. with some people, but... It might happens, work, yeah. When somebody yeah. destroys, like, a Christian relic, and then nothing happens there, either. Yeah, and and people would actually sometimes get really upset. That's that's also why they killed Bonifatius um, as well. So he he was well, he actually was most likely looking to become a martyr. Oh. Well, um, but yeah, so um, so that was one of the reasons. And what was also really popular was the whole uh, reference of saints. And they would take the bones and pieces of the body of the saints, like the, the remnants of the bones. And they would say, okay, well, these have like healing powers or special powers. And that would tap right into that old Germanic religion of uh, objects having souls or having, you know, having, uh, yeah, basically spiritual powers. Um, so, so yeah, but I mean, it, it did, but it took much longer in Frisia than many other places because people wouldn't just simply follow the religion of their ruler. Um, and it also shows you that, you know, it wasn't just by force that religion was spread. Actually, Christianity was spread. It took a long time, even when they had already taken over. Um, but yeah, so Dokkum is a place. And then in Utrecht is where they had the bishop where Bonifatius and uh, Willy Brod were working. So these English people that will come over here um so yeah, I, I thought it was an interesting story about how the the frisians basically are different people than we thought they were genetically um because they're not just normal uh a normal germanic tribe they were much more closely linked to the, the anglo the saxons and the utes well, those are also um, germanic tribes though too anyway. yeah they are i guess they are yeah yeah, they, but they, yeah, but they're also like their their lifestyle was also not all that different, and they had close cultural ties. Um, and uh, <clears throat> basically, they uh, in the end they lost to the Franks, which you know they took over here um, because they were uh, it, they had a much larger military force, and they were were closely allied, and they you know they had a centralized power. They had more advanced technology, I believe, as well, and yeah, more resources to draw from. You know, a lot of yeah, I think they uh, the Frisians was actually tried to get steel from the from the Frankish Empire because it was the best steel they had um, that was available at the time. Um, yeah, so it was a Roman province, well settled, well developed, and the Franks just took it over. You know, it, it we should sometime what we should do is we should do like a a post roman like uh, what happens like study the collapse of the roman empire and see just how much of the stuff was destroyed and how much of the stuff was maintained because in spain they still have like uh, some aqueducts that still work or they did they worked for like over a thousand years after the roman empire was gone and they're, they're still standing. I saw one like in, I think it was uh, Segovia when I was there. So it, it may be that the the Franks, they retained, a, they might have retained a lot of this stuff. And also it helps, you know, to have uh, food close to your battle lines and more men. And then the Frisians, they're, occupying a smaller area of land and they have the the sea behind them so they have less resources less people and no place really to fall back to right because yeah. they're be they'll be pushed to the sea so it's probably amazing if they you know that they held off as long as they did yeah and and they um they also held off the romans uh for they they participated in several revolts including the batavian revolt um, but those are the old freeze eye. Uh, but anyway, they, uh, if you look at the cultural uh, significance, I think uh, the southern part of the Netherlands along the Rhine River was uh, strongly influenced by Roman culture. Uh, whereas the Frisian, especially the northern parts of the Netherlands, uh, were not. Like they were in the influence uh, 
hemisphere, but for short times, and it was a lot less compared to the middle and the southern part of the country. Yeah. Um, so you, you'll see that they're more closely, I think, tied to, uh, and I'm somewhere in the middle, like in between, like there was actually a military camp uh, from the Romans, uh, which was their most furthest outpost they ever had 20 miles from where I live. Um, so yeah, anyway, I think it's interesting to think about the kind of uh, echoes that we that you hear from history uh, in, in, in today through culture um so people here the dutch still pride themselves of being uh stubborn and blunt and um yeah and there's also a story about uh two um Frisia going to uh, nero and uh because they had settled someplace along the rhine that wasn't under roman control and um and then somebody was giving them a tour uh, and he, they were sitting in a stadium enjoying some some kind of uh, play that you know they didn't understand a word of what was going on and they, they were sitting amongst the romans and i was like well what are what are all these uh these people there because there were people that looked different than the romans and said well those are the people that are uh that are most um uh you know, most uh, valuable to the Roman Empire because of their valor and how powerful they are. And then they said something along the lines of, well, there's nobody more powerful and uh, with more valor than the Germans or the, yeah. So, so uh, they just stood up and they sat amongst the, uh, the other people, the other dignitaries. And uh, apparently Nero was like, oh, that's really cool. It's a boss ass move. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, so anyway, but those are still things like, oh yeah, you know, like uh, we think very highly of ourselves, but I guess most people do. Um, but uh, I think that you definitely still see echoes in our culture today of being stubborn, being blunt, and uh, having a disrespect when it comes to authority. And I think those are actually good qualities to have, if you ask yeah, me. Yeah, that's how you protect yourself and, um, you know, from tyranny. And also, um, some of the the early, like the people that would settle here in the United States, the uh, I think it was the Puritans, they actually shifted to Netherlands first, and they lived there for a while, so they could have religious freedom. And then they decided, the reason they decided to move to America was because they they were afraid that they their kids would just assimilate and become Dutch and they would no longer be English anymore. So they, they moved here so they could have their religious freedom and their English culture as well. Yeah, which makes <laughs> sense, yeah, I guess, yeah. Yeah, yeah there are Dutch so colonies too, though. There okay, were, so yeah, around New York, I guess, or New Amsterdam at the time, but uh, yeah. So, so you said they speak a, that the, these people today they still speak a different language. They do, yeah. And, Can you understand uh, them? No, hardly. Like uh, I'll understand some words, you know. Like it's a, like, but I also understand Swedes if they speak sw slowly. So um, I, I do think it's more closely related to Dutch than Swedish is, um, because they have taken over some of our words. But yeah, no, it's a different language for sure. Is their language officially recognized by your government over there? Yeah. Yeah. So, and they have so their own uh, public TV station and it's taught in schools and, um, and, and, and things like that. So, yeah. yeah. But there are still some, some um, definitely some anger. Like as a non-Frisian, you probably don't want to live in what is now nowadays called Friesland, which is like their province. Um, uh, because uh, you, you might still, yeah, there might still be some animosity towards the Hollanders, which is what, you know, like what we would be, even though technically like, you know, we're I wouldn't same, be considered a same race and yeah, same, but we speak, yeah, we don't, we're not the same culture, I guess. Different. Hopefully. That's right. Yeah. Different ethnicities. Like uh, a lot of countries are multi-ethnic. Like a lot of people today, they incorrectly conflate ethnicity with race, but you're, your race is not an ethnicity. Your ethnicity is your culture and your language together. Yeah. So that's like a lot of countries, you know, a lot of people, they say 
oh, well, Africa is so violent because the the countries are multi-ethnic, the borders are not drawn along uh, ethnic lines. But the same is also true in a lot of European countries. Like, I didn't know that Netherlands was multi-ethnic. I knew Spain was and England was and France. And then, of course, the uh, the Balkans broke apart just because of these people that were like 90, 99% similar, like the 1% difference was too much. So, yeah, I believe that yeah. actually most of the the conflicts in the world, there's a lot more ethnic violence than there is racial violence and race hatred, like ethnic hatred is because ethnic hatred just continues to simmer. You have different groups that are too different to blend together. They're different enough that they don't easily blend, but then there's finite resources, so they're automatically competitors, especially if there's a, you know, anything like climate change or a famine, anything like that. Yeah, and there are also cultural elements. Like uh, I was talking about the bogs, and a lot of the bogs, um, if you actually dried up the soil, you could burn it in your oven. And that was used for heating for a long time. And we actually had penal colonies where we would send our people over to these bogs and to, to mine the stuff. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, people would die from all the mosquito bites and poor working conditions and everything. And, uh, you know, you still have very poor stuff like that. You still feel the echoes in some of the places uh, in the country as well. Um yeah, I, I think that's super interesting to see. Uh, that's not necessarily long ethnicity, uh, but you do create subcultures that are then based on uh, your income level, for example. Um, so yeah, shared status. Anyway. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So yeah, no, I thought it was cool. I've been to Leeuwarden, which is a cool city. It's the capital, um, as well as Harlingen, uh, which is right across the Afsluit Dyke, which is that large dike that I spoke about that connects the north of Holland to uh, to Friesland nowadays. And um, you also have uh, West Friesland, which is actually in North Holland. And then you have an Ost Friesland, which is in Germany today. And you also have a Friesland area in Denmark. Uh, as so well. they just got completely cut apart. Yeah, although, you know, basically everybody was Frisian, I think, at the time. But some people got assimilated because right next to Friesland, you have Groningen, which is, yeah, basically the same people, same conditions, but they speak Dutch over there. So... Mm. Yeah. So, but then in the south, the Franks basically assimilated most of the country, and then you also have some Saxon influence from the east as well. So, yeah, it's uh, it's cool if you look uh, a little bit more deeply. You know, they say it's like, oh, you know, like there, there, you can just look at the color. But yeah, like you said, uh, color is just one thing. <laughs> Ethnicity uh, is definitely a major part as well. There's different different cultures. Um, you know, the South is uh, Catholic, the North is mostly Protestant. There are a different, lot of different ways to uh, to look at it. So a lot of differences. Yeah, one thing I've yeah. found through studying history and culture for my whole life is that um, go to any part of the world and the people there have more views, opin opinions and feelings about those who live next to them than the neighboring groups. Than they, than they do about people that come from like the other side of the world. So, you know, people talk about like race hatred, like, oh, this is that, yeah. But if you take like the first person that comes over from the other side of the world, they don't have any feelings about that for the most part. Or they might be like, oh, hey, you know, they might be curious, like, oh, hey, you know, blah. but they won't hate that person, but they will hate their neighbors that they've been competing with for resources for thousands of years. That's where all their opinions are. That, that's the yeah. average thing like um for yeah example, it's very it's going to be very hard to drive to make that go away i know like growing up in a small town uh, there was a town next to ours we would look down upon that town <laughs> <laughs> why don't i don't know man i think they were a bit poorer on average than we were and well, uh, like yeah yeah the, the Frisians there will have more opinions about like the, the government of holland and the you know france then they'll have about like zimbabwe yeah and zulus oh yeah like, for oh. sure yeah like they don't feel anything about a zulu but the zulu is going to feel strongly about 
like uh, the other tribes that are there. I think uh, I don't know. I don't want to say something wrong because I I know, but uh, yeah, they'll have more feelings about their neighbors where they which they have history with than somebody who comes from the other side of the world. They only people only start caring about like immigrants from distant places when it gets to the point where there's a lot of them and then they start becoming a competing group with with your group otherwise yeah, the, the frisians were definitely uh, suppressed by uh amsterdam for for you know throughout the centuries yep. um so they definitely have become more patriotic than the average dutch person is for example so even frisians living in uh, in amsterdam or like in my neighborhood, you'll find some people flying the Frisian flag. They have their own flag. Um, you know, they have their own traditions around ice skating, about uh, specific types of sailing, and they feel very strongly about those. They have their own sports, and um, they're they're much more patriotic than the average Dutch person is because of uh, because of this history of uh, basically trying to fight for their cultural survival. I guess so. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, cool place. If you're ever in uh, in the area, <laughs> uh, Leeuwarden is pretty pretty nice city, and I think that's one of the cool uh, things um, um, about uh, the Netherlands is uh, you, you'll find uh, a lot of different types of cities and cultures all packed in a tiny country. So it's quite easy to look at uh, different things, and um, you don't have to travel a lot to do yeah, so. Yeah. Eventually, I'd like to come over there, but. You know, things need to change and calm down before I do any long distance traveling. Yeah, no, I get that. Same here. I, I'm not Otherwise, sure if I'll be going back to the States uh, just uh, anytime soon either. So, yeah, yeah, I'll have to see what happens with that. But if ever, if, if ever, if ever we do get back to normal, then I'll definitely come over there. I've already been to Spain and Morocco, so it'd be interesting to go visit uh, netherlands as well and maybe see some old viking site that'd be cool too if there's any there that are still to be seen there's a cool park nearby called archeon uh, where they reenact different uh, it's not the same but still there you have people that reenact and living in the type of uh, and they're actually archaeologists that uh, that will be doing all kinds of cool stuff but yeah yeah all right so that was my topic for this week and uh with that uh want to say ivor thanks for your time and listeners thanks for listening if you're still there give us a like um and subscribe and uh, hopefully see you next week in ivor's topic yeah thanks guys great good choice okay. yeah i didn't know most of that